Well, good morning. Everybody's here already. Um, I have to track down the file for today, although we're going to start by um, looking at a, a video I took yesterday of a couple of uh, uh, magnetism demonstrations. And so those will be the first things we do. Oh, um. <laughs> Stop. Hmm. I thought I was able to make that thing muted. Um, that's weird. What did I open it with? No. There we go. Separate thing. Okay. Um, I'll share the screen over there and you can see what this thing's going to look like. Okay. What you're seeing right now is a, it's a glass bulb that has a um, cathode in it and actually I don't know if you can see my cursor at all but the cathode is this little glowing wire right here and a cathode was named way back in the 1800s um, later they discovered things that could come off of a cathode and they called those cathode rays and the original team or term for a computer monitor was a cathode ray tube and uh, cathode rays are just electrons but they didn't know that at the time and uh, so uh, if you make current go through a wire and you get it to the point where it's glowing the collisions between atoms in the wire are violent enough to knock electrons loose from it and so that's how they produced a source of electrons. Um, anyway, that's glowing. And then within this little metal part right here, and again, I don't know if you can see the cursor, but there is a couple of plates there, and they're kept at a high potential relative to the cathode, a positive potential, and the electrons will be pulled toward that positive potential. Um, there's an accelerating electron or accelerating voltage in there of, I think I've got it set on around, oh, somewhere between two and 400 volts, actually. I don't remember exactly what I had it set on, but uh, um, right now you can see a faint bluishness in here, and that's caused when the electrons collide with mercury atoms in the glass bulb and those mercury atoms give off light. So that's what's going on here. And I go over and turn the lights off so you can see this thing better. You can see my reflection walking back and forth in the room. 
I think I was just making sure everything was still set up correctly. Okay, now you can see that um, electron beam a little bit letter, better. And I'm bringing a bar magnet near it here. And if I get the bar magnet oriented just right, I can bend that electron beam. And so, and then I've got another bar magnet up on the left side that I'm trying to get it to bend backwards with. And when I get it, it's a little chaotic trying to get those things aligned correctly. But uh, once in a while, I'll get it oriented approximately right. And then I think I went and picked up a really big magnet, a great big U-shaped magnet that you'll see the partner of here in a little bit. And uh, you can see with it, I can make that electron beam just do all kinds of stuff. And and then somewhere here, yeah. Um, I don't know if I have a picture of this for you. I might have, but uh, there is a, a pair of coils that are around the glass bulb. And when I make current go through those coils, they produce a nice uniform magnetic field. And the electron beam in that case bends in this circular arc. And uh, this outer one is the actual electron beam. The inner one you're seeing is a reflection of that off the back of the glass bulb. So anyway, those are the electrons are moving charges. Uh, they're affected by the magnetic field and bend in a particular way. If you have a, <clears throat> a particularly well-behaved field like that of the, the coils, um, looks like that was the end of that video. I think I may have uh, some pictures I took of that. We'll see. Yeah, this is the experimental setup, which hopefully you can see. Um, here's the glass bulb. These are the coils that are around it, and there's actually a pair of coils. <coughs> and uh, they happen to be the distance between the planes of the two coils is equal to the radius of the coils. And when you have that particular configuration, you get a uniform, pretty uniform magnetic field within the region right near the center. So that's what's going on. Um, this power supply right here uh, serves two purposes. One, it uh, these two wires right here provide current to the cathode, and that's all they do, and they heat the cathode up so it glows. So uh, there's that. And then these two wires right here provide the accelerating voltage. And it looks like uh, this is all the way over the needle on the scale for the voltage is all the way over. So I probably had it turned up to 400 volts. Um, this voltmeter just monitors that, and unfortunately you can't see it very well right now. And then this power supply over here provides the current needed for the coils themselves. And then this is an ammeter that monitors, <coughs> excuse me, monitors the current going to the coils. This is an experiment that maybe late in the quarter, um, I'll see if I can get permission for you to come and do this experiment. But this experiment can be used to determine the charge to mass ratio of the electron. And what I've done in the past is I'll just have students come in in uh, usually teams of two and uh, I'll leave all the wires set up and everything and you can uh, um, take a series of measurements to determine that charge to mass ratio. <clears throat> I don't have it set up on here right now, but uh, behind the bulb there's a, a ruler that you can set there. It's a glass ruler and it's 
uh, got light bulbs at either end so it's kind of illuminated when you're doing this experiment in the dark and you can use that to measure the uh, diameter and then the radius of the the curvature of the electron path. So <clears throat> that's the the experimental setup for this one and I don't know I may have taken more pictures of this well maybe just one that's in a little better focus okay and these were some that I just took still pictures of the thing in the electron beam okay and that's the the next one what picture is that 6336 we'll talk about that here in a little bit actually we can talk about it pretty soon um, yeah, maybe I'll just go back to that thing. Uh, this is another demonstration that shows the effect of uh, the magnetic field on, a, on moving charges. But in this case, the charges are all stuck inside a wire. <clears throat> and I have um, a power supply here that provides current for the wire and then I've this thing here is actually a limiting resistor and it's a, a type of resistor that can dissipate a whole lot of heat and so uh, that's what's going on with that one and and then uh, I've got long leads that go up here and I've got them wrapped around an aluminum bar so they don't put too much weight on it and I've got a coil of heavy copper wire and I think it's probably 12 gauge although I don't remember for sure but it's um, on this bar in a way that it can easily rotate and it's pretty stiff copper wire the way it looks um, I haven't straightened it out in a few years but uh, and then here <clears throat> right here is a large u-shaped magnet I used its twin um, to make the the electron path bend a whole bunch on that other experiment. And I think I may have a, yeah, this is a picture at a side. This is what this thing says. And this has a, a warning on it, um, radiation warning. But the warning was because the magnet was used in some kind of an x-ray machine or something like that. And it was the x-rays that were the problem thing you had to watch out for, not the magnet. So, and uh, when there's no current flowing through the wire, this is basically the do nothing position for that, that hanging stiff wire. And uh, the magnetic field is still there. The magnetic field of a magnet like this will either point from this bottom pole here straight up to the top one or vice versa. <clears throat> and I just don't worry about which way it happens to be poking. But uh, anyway, that's the, the setup for that thing. And then I'll show you a film. I think it's this longer one of this experiment and how it acts. And I'll mute it again if it isn't already. Yeah, it's already muted. OK, and right now there's no current flowing in the, in the wire. And now there is. And I usually turn the current up to around 4 amperes in uh, this wire. It can easily handle it. There, I'm just increasing the current. Now it's probably up to about 4 amperes. And so you can see what happens. Uh, an interesting thing here is that if I was to take something that was actually attracted to a magnet, like say a paper clip or something like that, it would be pulled almost instantly to this bottom part here or the top part here. And now I'm showing what happens if I reverse the, the magnet there, flip it upside down, then I'll have the current go in the same direction again. This is just to make a possible change in there. And not so easy to see, but that wire is being pushed out of the magnet now. So the wire acts different than a uh, something like a paper clip does. 
it doesn't go toward the poles of the magnet, which are the, the little parts right here or down there. It goes in the opposite direction. Now, this time, um, what I'm going to try is reversing the flow of the current. And I just switched the leads on there. And remember before when the magnet was in this orientation, the wire was pulled into the center of it. And now when the magnet is in that orientation, it's pushed out. <clears throat> so depending on the direction of the current flow, that will determine the direction of the force that the magnet exerts. I forgot to turn the current off there before I flipped it this time. Okay, and now with it flipped and the current reversed, the, the wire is pulled into that interior area there. But again, um, it's kind of weird. I'm going to pause this here and hopefully I can um, have my cursor illustrate something. The current in the wire, uh, we don't actually, well, we could figure it out, but it's either going along the wire in this direction or along the wire in this direction. And the current that's in these vertical portions of it aren't going to play much of a role here. Uh, the magnetic field actually gets quite a bit weaker as you move in those directions away from the magnet. So uh, they won't amount to much. But anyway, um, so the direction of the current flow is along the, the wire here, one direction or the other. And it turns out if it's positive charges going one direction or negative charges going the opposite direction, it doesn't make any difference in this experiment there is an experiment that that matters for, and I'll talk about that in a, a day or two. Well, not tomorrow, tomorrow's test day, but um, I'll talk about that a bit later. The magnetic field, though, is going downward in this direction or upward in this direction, but it's along a line like that. So the velocity is one direction. The magnetic field is another direction. Um, the wire is absolutely full of charges all the time. Um, we didn't learn about the uh, electric currents in a wire, but uh, the charges in a wire move at slower than a snail's pace. Typical speeds for charges in a wire are on the, the order of a finger length per hour, something like that. What races through the wire is the electric field that pushes the charges, but the charges themselves move very, very slowly. So that's something that happens. However, um, the charges are moving in a direction like this. The magnetic field is in a direction like this. And the force on the charges or on the current is perpendicular to both of those. It's either pushing that wire out or pulling that wire in. And when you start dealing with magnetism, you instantly have to start dealing in three dimensions. And so that's something that's a bit of a challenge. Um, you saw in the, uh, the other experiment with the coils, and actually I could go back to that or one of those pictures, I think. Um, yeah, with this setup here, that um, the magnetic field that's made by these coils of wire actually points down the axis of the coils. And so uh, the electron velocity, when they were coming off of the cathode here, was from left to right. The magnetic field is down the coils of the wire and it's either going into the coils from this viewpoint or back toward you from, it depends on the direction of the current flow, which I don't uh, know off the top of my head. But at any rate, the 
acceleration of the electrons was perpendicular to the direction of the magnetic field and perpendicular to the velocity of the of the uh, electrons as well and so that's something that we'll just have to learn to deal with here so i'm gonna switch over to our ipvo visualizer here and well i won't because i haven't turned it on yet um hang on a second here Okay, that should work. You should be able to see that on there. And um, I'll just blow this up. I want to give it something to focus on first. The software for uh, this thing changed with no notification and it looks it's taken on a completely different look in the last couple of weeks okay go on to there all right um hopefully you can see this if this is the velocity of the electron and Let's just suppose that this isn't a very good pin anymore. Um, I think that's supposed to be heavy enough. Anyway, if this is the direction of the magnetic field, then what we'll end up with is that the force will either be up in this direction or down in that direction and the force ends up being perpendicular to both the velocity and the uh it's hard to draw um both the velocity and the magnetic field now we're going to use the letter b for the magnetic field And we're going to measure it in units called Tesla and named after, whoops, if I could spell it, T-E-S-L-A is what it is. And it's named after Nikola Tesla, who was, let's see, a Serbian scientist who came to the United States in the late 1800s. And he was a contemporary of Thomas Edison's, although I don't think they got along particularly well. Uh, he also, at the time, uh, Westinghouse, George Westinghouse, I think his name was, was uh, another scientist in the northeastern United States doing experiments with electricity and magnetism. But anyway, the abbreviation for a Tesla is a capital T. And we'll look at the combination of units that make that up here in a little bit. Um, but it turns out that the force exerted by the magnetic field is equal to the charge. And if you have a neutral particle, the magnetic field won't affect it. Say something like a neutral atom may not be affected by the magnetic field, although it may orient itself uh, depending on how its charge is distributed, it may orient it itself in a particular way, but it'll also be proportional to the velocity and proportional to the strength of the magnetic field. No surprise with that one, but what shows up between these two vectors is the cross product. And that's something that um, we haven't really dealt with yet. Um, I'll show you a few things about the cross product, but actually let's just figure out the units of that magnetic field first. Um, over here we're going to have newtons, 
for the charge, we'll measure that in coulombs. And then for the speed, typically meters per second. And then we've got these units of Tesla out here. And so I can solve for the units of the Tesla and it turns out they're gonna equal, let's see, a Newton, I'm gonna leave it this way, over a Coulomb meter per second. And so, now remember a Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared, so we could probably do some playing around with that. But most of the time we leave it more or less, we leave the numerator alone, but a Coulomb per second is an ampere. That's our metric system unit of current and its abbreviation is an amp. And so I could also write this Tesla as a Newton per amp meter. And that's usually the combination of units that I remember for a Tesla. Uh, it's just, just happens to be easy to remember. Although uh, there's plenty of times that we'll have so many units going on some of these upcoming problems that I'll have to use a cheat sheet to keep track of them some of the time because it uh, just gets confusing. All right, a little bit about the cross product, which I don't remember that. Did we talk about torques at all? I can't remember. Maybe a tiny bit. Yeah, we did sometime last did quarter. Does the cross or maybe late? Yeah, maybe last quarter or late fall quarter. Um, did we do anything with the cross product at all or not? Um, I don't recall actually in this class, but things about the cross product, the magnitude of a cross product, if we're just dealing with um, say A cross B and the cross product is a vector product. Um, you can see that we've got a vector on the left side and two vectors on the right side. In fact, it's sometimes called the vector product. It, um, the dot product, when you had a dot between things is sometimes called the scalar product because it takes two vectors and produces a scalar. So this is a different type of multiplication. The magnitude of it though, which if you just put some bars around it, sometimes you'll see pairs of bars on either side, but um, this will be good enough. But it's equal to the magnitude of one of the ve vectors, the magnitude of the other vector, and the sine, whoops, <laughs> sine, uh, sine of the angle between the two vectors. So um, it'll look like that. So if I had a vector A that went in a direction like this, and then a vector B in that direction, if they were separated by an angle phi, where you could join their two things together there, then that would, it would be the sine of that angle. And uh, that part's a little bit weird. So what about the direction of this cross product? Okay, um, you may find this kind of hard, but um, we're going to use something called the right hand rule to determine the direction of a cross product. And if I have a vector A here and a vector B here, A cross B, to figure it out, and I like you to have an intuitive feel for the direction that these vectors are going to point, point the fingers of your right hand in the direction of the first vector so that you can curl them toward the second vector. Okay, if I pointed my hand that way, I can't curl my fingers backwards very well. And so that wouldn't be right. So point the fingers of your right hand in the direction of the first vector so that you can curl them toward the second vector and your thumb will point in the direction of the cross product. So um, we'll be using this a lot here in this magnetism section, not just um, for forces on individual moving charges, but 
we'll use it for determining the direction of a magnetic field and all kinds of stuff. So anyway, A cross B looks like that. Now, here's the thing. If I pointed the fingers of my right hand in the direction of B so that I could curl them toward A, my thumb would point in the, the opposite direction. And that's a way that you can get it. Now, A cross B ends up equaling the negative of B cross A. This may be the first time you've run into something where the commutative law breaks down. And when things have this property, you say that they're anti-commutative. So you multiply the vectors in one direction if you're using the cross product and you get a, a vector that points one direction. If you do it in the opposite order, your cross product will point in the opposite direction. So, kind of scary. Anyway, anti-commutative. So, as far as this force that a magnetic field exerts on a moving charge, it's best to just remember it F equals QV cross B. And, uh, be careful that uh, things that are vectors have to be vectors and that you do them in the right order. Um, first time I ever ran into anything that was not commutative was when, uh, when I started calculus at Eastern. I was taking calculus and physics and I don't remember what I'd started taking. I think just piano lessons that quarter. And uh, they, the first week of the calculus course, actually the first day, they said, uh, we've got one section of, calc of uh, linear algebra that's absolutely full and a second section that doesn't quite have enough students to make it go. Would any of you like to take linear algebra this quarter? And if you do take linear algebra, we won't have the material in the first quarter of it. It was a two quarter class at Eastern. We won't have the material in the first quarter that requires calculus. And I thought, well, shoot, it's required for my physics major, so I may as well take, actually, I didn't know what I was majoring in yet. I hadn't settled on physics yet. It was required for the math major, which I was kind of leaning toward, and also the computer science major. So I decided to take it. And first thing we start doing in there is uh, learning to deal with matrices and multiplying matrices and stuff like that. And I had never dealt with those at all before. And uh, turns out when you multiply matrices, uh, <laughs> not only are they not commutative, if you don't do them in the order, you can't even multiply, the correct order, you can't even multiply them. And I forgot that when the first test came along and absolutely bombed it. And I'd never done so badly on any test in my life before. And apparently most of the class did. And so they let us do it as a take home assignment for a kind of redo on there. And boy, I learned that mistake fast. Was that that works out. So anyway, that's what anti-commutative things are. Now, there's a formal way of writing a uh, cross product that we're not going to have to deal with in this class because we're mostly going to be doing hand waving stuff. Um, I can remember in grad school one time, um, one of our assignments, we would have a quarter time teaching assistantship or a half time teaching assistantship. And uh, you'd teach four labs a week. And then also as part of that, you would uh, um, proctor tests and the tests were these uh, given in these huge auditoriums and there'd be 250 students taking a physics test at the same time and it was kind of funny to be in there when they gave a test on magnetism because uh, you'd see all these students in the room <laughs> almost as soon as they started the test they'd be doing stuff like this with their hands and uh, seeing a whole room of 
people being absolutely silent, looking at their test and going stuff like that was kind of funny. However, here's the formal, um, a formal version of calculating a cross product. And uh, let's suppose A is A sub X along I hat plus A sub Y along J hat plus A sub Z along K hat and B looks similar, but it's got its own components. And these things can be, you know, these components can be positive, negative, just about everything you can think of. And A cross B is going to look pretty darn scary if I write it out, but I'll show you the shorthand version first. Um, Okay, this is actually a mathematical operation that you can perform on a matrix called a determinant. And this is the shorthand way of writing it. This is actually a much shorthand way of writing it. But what this will equal is something kind of scary, and we're not going to do this, but I just want to show it to you. You'll see it soon in a math class, probably. Um, Okay, so that's what it'll look like. And that's just a precursor to some future mathematics class. Uh, some of you may take linear algebra. I can't remember doing a ton of this in Mr. Lane's linear algebra class. Um, I retook linear algebra about three years ago just for fun. Because when I took it as a student at Eastern, uh, <laughs> I was kind of buried in the classes I was taking um, between calculus, physics, and linear algebra, and the piano lessons, which actually had a more than equal time demand to the uh, any of the hard classes I was taking. Um, and then I was working part-time too. So it was crazy, but I just wanted to relearn this stuff. But I remember spending a lot of time with this stuff when I took linear algebra. The one thing I did not like about my linear algebra course at Eastern was they never once mentioned an application of linear algebra that it might actually be useful. And there wasn't any mentioned in the book either. So I get done with this class thinking, why in the world did I take that? And I took it too early. I should have taken it in my junior or senior year because it turned out when I got to graduate school, linear algebra is extremely important in studying quantum mechanics, which is the the physics of the atomic and subatomic world, but it was never mentioned in any of the classes I'd taken. So um, I just resented taking the class because I couldn't see a use for it. And so I forgot a lot of it um, and never got to use it again. But uh, at any rate, that's the cross product. Now, I want to take a look at just a few example problems here that maybe won't need this. And actually, I'll sort of show these to you. Um, we'll stay on screen two, which is what we are looking at. But I'll get off of this thing for the time being. And close out this. And close out that. And close out that. Holy cow. There we go. No exit out of that. All right, here's the first problem. We have an electron in a TV camera tube moving at 
7.2 times 10 to the 6 meters per second in a magnetic field of strength 83 millitesla. By the way, a tesla is actually a pretty strong magnetic field. The Earth's magnetic field is about one ten thousandth of that or less. So um, there's actually another unit of magnetic field strength called a gauss. And one gauss is actually one ten thousandth of a tesla. It's not used so much anymore, but um, still a tesla is a pretty strong field. Although if you've ever had a a, uh, an MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, the magnetic field that they use for that is on the order of about 10 Tesla. And uh, if you ever have one of those, they make sure you take off all your jewelry first. Um, you have to lay still while you're having it done. I don't know what the deal is with fillings, if they're not a problem or what. I guess they maybe don't have uh, ferrous metal in them any magnetic metal. But if you had steel plates in your body, that could be a problem for an MRI. Um, I had one done, oh, it's been more than 10 years now, but I was in a car accident and had a couple of compression fracture in my vertebrae and they um, uh, did an MRI to look at those things. <laughs> and I was laying there in the machine and, or peppering the guy with questions. How strong is this magnetic field and what do they use for the currents and all this other stuff? <laughs> I don't think he ever got questions like that um, from anybody, but I just thought it was fascinating. Um, some people feel claustrophobic in them, but I was just enjoying the whole thing. Anyway, we've got a, a an electron in this TV camera tube going at a pretty good clip. Magnetic field of strength 83 millitesla without knowing the direction of the field, what could be the greatest and least magnitudes of force the electron could feel due to the field? Well, that's kind of interesting. I'm going to switch back to the IPBO thing to be able to answer that. And zoom in on this. Uh, I can't. Okay, well, um, Hopefully you can read that on there. It's the same question. The greatest and the least is related to the magnitude of that uh, cross product. And if we just write this as the magnitude of the force on something, it's going to be QVB sine of that angle between the velocity and the magnetic field. Now, the sine has a value of zero if the angle between those two is zero or if it's 180 degrees. So the minimum force that's exerted on a charge could be zero. If its velocity is lined up with the magnetic field, that would be the case. So the least is easy to calculate, it's zero. But the maximum, um, is going to be just plain QVB. So it's an electron, so it has a charge of 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. Uh, let's see, going to run out of room here, of course. 7.2 times 10 to the 6th. meters per second, and then I multiply by that magnetic field, which is 83 times 10 to the minus third Tesla. And so I can just multiply those together. Unit wise, the Coulomb meter per second is like a Coulomb per second times a meter. And remember the Tesla was a Newton per amp meter. So I'll end up with Newtons for the force here. And that maximum force is then going to equal just the product of those things there. And it's not going to be much, but it's acting on an electron, which uh, doesn't have much mass.
Okay, and I get about 9.6. I think we've only got two sig figs. 9.6 times 10 to the minus 14th. Newtons. Now, let's see. Is that about correct? Let's see. This would be 10 to the minus 13th. 10 to the minus 3rd is 10 to the minus 16th. Yeah, that's a reasonable value. <clears throat> okay, at one point the acceleration is 4.9 times 10 to the 16th meters per second squared. What's the angle between the electron's velocity and the magnetic field? Well, we can figure this out because uh, this is the maximum force, but in general, the force would equal F max times the sine of the angle between the two. Okay. And that will equal the mass of the electron times its acceleration. Well, they told us the electron or the acceleration we know the mass of the electron, or at least we can look it up quick. I remember what it is. And so, and we know what F max is. So the only thing we don't know here is the sine of phi. So the sine of phi would then equal that mass times acceleration over this force. <clears throat> mass of the electron, 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. The acceleration is, running out of room again, 4.9 times 10 to the 16th meters per second squared. And then I just divide by that F max that I got here. 9.6 times 10 to the minus 14th. And I'll bring down another piece of paper, another whole batch of paper. There we go. Okay, so the sine of phi ends up being some amount, and then we can calculate the inverse sine of that. about 0 0.47. So the angle between those two things, let's see. About 27, 28 degrees. So there, there's our first one. New batch of physics here. Um, Second one on here, I don't know if you can read that or not, but it says magnetic fields are often used to bend a beam of electrons in physics experiments. That's the way to do it. Uh, what uniform magnetic field applied perpendicular to a beam of electrons moving at 1.3 times 10 to the sixth meters per second is required to make the electrons travel in a circular arc of radius 0.35 meters. Here's the thing. When you have a force that is always perpendicular to the velocity, it'll make the things travel in a circle, if you've got a uniform magnetic field anyway. And so that's kind of fun. Well, let's take a look at it. Um, in this case, the magnetic field is perpendicular to the beam of electrons. Now a beam of electrons is just a whole bunch of electrons that have a common velocity. And so the magnetic field will be perpendicular to that. And so the force in this case is just going to equal the QVB. And we can just deal with a single one of the electrons and they're all going to behave the same way because they all have the same velocity. So, and that'll be that, but that force is going to cause centripetal acceleration. So that'll be the MA and that'll be MV squared over 
r, whatever the radius of curvature is, and they give us that. So we don't know the magnetic field, it's B that we're after. And so if you were designing an experiment, you'd wanna know if you wanna bend the electrons in a particular radius of radius beam, that's how this would work out. So setting this equal to this, QVB equals MV squared over R, and then solving for B, Oh, and I've got a V here and a V there. I'm just dealing with magnitudes of that. So it's just MV over QR. So 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. And V is, I forgot what it was, 1.3 times 10 to the sixth. These are high speeds, but it's not hard to get electrons moving that fast. Let's see, and then Q was, oh, charge on the electron, 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. And then the radius was 0.35 meters. Now, this combination of units will give me a Tesla, but it doesn't look so familiar. Um, in fact, uh, this is going to be kind of crazy, but actually we could see the more fundamental units of the Tesla. Um, if these meters and those meters divide out, I'll have kilograms on top and coulomb seconds on the bottom. So that's another way of thinking of a Tesla, a kilogram per coulomb second. It's hard to keep them all straight. Or I can multiply the top by one over seconds and the bottom by one over seconds. And then I'll have a kilogram meter per second squared, which is a Newton. And on the bottom, I'll have a Coulomb per second, which is an amp. So I'll have my Newton per amp meter. And I'm back to that thing again. So whatever that comes out to, just estimating, let's see, it looks like 6 times 10 to the 12th, 10 to the minus 12th, 10 to the minus 6. So fairly small magnetic field. I think. Okay, and I get about 2.1 times 10 to the minus fifth Tesla. And so uh, that would be on the order of the strength of the Earth's magnetic field, actually. In a lot of places on the surface, it's around 5 times 10 to the minus 5th Tesla. So something like that. If you were doing this experiment, the Earth's magnetic field could foul up your measurements. Um, because it might actually be stronger than this and make a tighter arc. So you'd have to worry about that. But uh, start reading the section of the book on the magnetic field to get some uh, background into that. And that will be chapter 27 is what it happens to be. So have a look at that. It'll have lots of examples and they have better drawings than I'm ever going to do for sure. And we'll talk about some of the possible applications of this. One of them is something called a velocity selector, which is kind of a neat thing. Yeah, chapter 27 is the one. Alrighty, well, I'll stop there. Were we going to have a review session tonight for the test? I can't remember. Does that sound familiar? I think we were. <laughs> okay. Um, or this afternoon.
what would be best. Somebody works days, I think. Let's see, I'm given a test from 7 to about 8.15. Is 8.30 too late to have such a thing? Or, or should we do it earlier, actually? Oh, I'll have to put out a doodle poll or send emails out. And uh, if you could send emails in and let me know what's what would be a convenient time, then I'll try and pick, pick a time that works best. Um, I know after eight is kind of late, but it could work. I could stay awake that long, I think. So um, be watching for messages on that, I guess, and we'll see. Oh, that might work out. Okay, um, I need to give a test next hour, so should be exciting. I'll be talking to you later today sometime.